Welcome to the Demand Curve Growth Summit. I'm here with Nir Ayal, and I'm very excited for us to, to dive in and, and speak about all things habit today. Um, to kick things off, I'd love to pass it over to Nir to just introduce yourself. You know, how did you get to where you are today and, and kind of kick it off from there? Sure thing. So my name is Nir Ayal, and I am a behavioral designer. So I help companies build the kind of products and services that create healthy habits in users' lives. So my first book, Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products, was based on a class that I taught at Stanford Graduate School of Business. And it essentially teaches companies how to uh, use the psychology of habit formation to build sticky products that improve people's lives. So when it comes to uh, health tech, fintech, ed tech, any type of product that needs repeat engagement, uh, if you need to build a customer habit, you've got to use a hook. And so that's what the Hooked model is all about that I describe in my book. It's all about these, these four steps that we see endemic to all sorts of habit forming products, um, enterprise, consumer web, uh, even offline products and online products, anything that needs repeat engagement has got to have a hook. And so that's what my first book is about. My second book is called Indistractable which is about how to control your attention and choose your life. And so it's kind of the other side. If Hooked is about how to build good habits, Indistractable is about how do we break these bad habits, particularly when it comes to that bad habits around distraction. And so this was a book I really wrote for myself because I found I was constantly distracted by the pings, dings, and rings in our modern world. And so I thought it was a problem that just had to do with technology, uh, but it turns out it's much deeper and I think much more interesting uh, when, when I discovered that the, the root cause of distraction wasn't our devices. It's actually, there's, there's a real psychological basis for why we get distracted. But if we can become what I call indistractable, that's a superpower, right? If you can simply do the things you know you need to do, because we all do, right? We all know we need to exercise. We all know we need to focus on our work. We all know we need to be fully present with our family and friends, but we don't do it. <laughs> so the book really challenges us to figure out why we don't do what we say we're going to do and helps us reimagine what our life would look like if we truly did control our attention. That's how we choose our life. Wonderful. How did you get into habit design? What, what landed you on, on, on that area of uh, specialty in specific? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a three-time founder. And in my second company, uh, I was at the intersection of gaming and advertising. And I had this front row seat into how companies uh, build products to change user behavior, right? Gaming and advertising are specialists, are masters in changing user behavior. Uh, they don't do that for their health. They do that because it's very profitable. And I had this, this amazing um, opportunity to work with my clients, friends, and customers to figure out uh, what, how they were doing what they were doing. And some companies would do it incredibly well. And some companies would fall flat on their face. And I wanted to know why and how. And I looked for a book on how do you build habit-forming products. I couldn't find one. And I think habits uh, at the time, this was back in 2012, I had this hypothesis that habits would become increasingly important. And the reason is that the, the, the screen interface is shrinking, right? So as we went from big desktop screens to laptop screens, to mobile screens, to wearable screens, like on our Apple Watch. And now screens have disappeared altogether. With ubiquitous computing, when you think about Amazon Alexa, for example, there is no screen, there is no visual interface, it's an audio interface. What that means, therefore, that habits become more important. That if customers don't, and users don't remember to use your product, you might as well not exist. And so you have to create what's called unprompted engagement, that you can only send so many pings, dings, and rings uh, you have to get the customer eventually uh, for certain type of products, not all products, but for most, you know, SaaS products, uh, education products, healthcare products, you know, pretty much every industry you could think of. If it is a repeat uh, uh, engagement type business, you have to get people to come back on their own. So when I was looking for, hey, how do I do this? How do I build a habit forming product? I didn't see any guidebook. And so I started blogging about it and writing about it for myself. And then I got an invitation to teach at the Stanford Graduate School of Business. And uh, that's when I kind of dove into this research and really fleshed it out. And that became Hooked. Wow. And through your, your research for the book Hooked, um, I imagine you, you were speaking with a lot of different founders and what have you. For the ones that did do it right, what was their path since they were operating in a world before your book came out? How did they start to figure these things out? How were they you know, doing things with their product that were, you know, you know, either by design or, or not yeah. um, creating these habits. 
Yeah. So, so this is, you know, what's interesting is that I didn't create these techniques, right? So many of the techniques I talk about in the book, I, I didn't invent them. It's just part of human psychology. And it's something that actually, you know, the psychology department at your university knows all about, right. <laughs> but these cer certain industries, um, what was interesting is the, 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 the academic community had names for things, but didn't really practically apply them, right? Like, you know, in academia, uh, product design is not a top priority for most academics. It's more about personal health. And on the on the other side, the, the the practitioners, the product designers, were using the techniques and had no idea what they were called, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, it's 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 rare that uh, people you know put the name to an identity of why these techniques work. So in the gaming and advertising industry, what I saw is that uh, uh, you know ad agencies, game companies, social media companies, they were using these techniques, but they weren't using them with an understanding of the deeper psycholo psychology of why they work. They just know they did. And so it would get passed on from, uh, uh, you know, uh, product manager to product manager. It, people would copy each other's uh, design patterns and say, oh, it seems to be working over there. Let's do it too. Uh, and it did work, but they wouldn't know really why. And so what I wanted to provide was a framework so that people understand the deeper reason why. Because when you understand the fundamental consumer psychology, your aperture widens. You know, if you just copy your competition you're copying somebody who typically also doesn't know what the hell they're doing. <laughs> and so maybe it'll work, maybe it won't, but your, your, your chances of, of, uh, of a successful uh, product innovation, a successful feature increase exponentially when you actually follow some kind of framework, as opposed to just, you know, throwing uh, spaghetti against the wall and seeing what sticks or asking uh, the, the, the hippo, right. Everybody knows what the hippo is. The hippo is the highest paid person's opinion, you know, asking the boss, Hey boss, what should we build? Well, they don't necessarily know, right. Even the customer, right. When, when, when I got started, the big uh, innovation um, uh, was customer development as proposed by Steve Blank and Eric Reese. We, we should absolutely do that. We should talk to customers, but there are many things that customers can't tell us they need. Every designer out there has built a product that their customer says, oh, I really need this feature. I really need you to do this. And then you build it and they don't use it. Mm -hmm. What the hell? <laughs> right. It, and and it, without understanding the deeper psychology of why people do what they do, you're, you're just getting lucky as opposed to having some kind of filter, some kind of model that will help product development uh, so that you build the right thing sooner. Because, you know, when we think about the build, measure, learn loop of how people build products these days, you know, the, 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 the measuring and the learning is easy. That's fun. The hard part is the building. That's where all the blood, sweat, and tears and money all go. So if we can build the right things sooner, if we can come up with good hypotheses that are more likely to succeed, we spend less time, money, and effort building the wrong stuff. And so I propose, instead of just listening to the hippo, instead of just listening to the customer, God forbid, just listen to the VCs and build what they want. That's, that's the worst of all options. Instead, Build with some kind of model, build with a good understanding of consumer psychology, that's going to increase your likelihood of success. Mm -hmm. And for these, these models in particular, um, I imagine as you were dipping into the world of psychology, you know, at different psychologists and different schools of thought probably have different philosophies and different frameworks. Um, you maybe want to touch on some of the frameworks you were, you were pulling from and through this process? Sure. Yeah. So there's, so I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants trying to uh, uh, amalgamate a model that's, uh, uh, that's not, that's simple, but not simplistic. Right. Meaning the hardest part of what I did in the five years writing each of my books was to filter out the superfluous information. That's nice. That's interesting, but not exactly relevant to the, the problem I was trying to solve. So both my books start with how to, right? The subtitle is how to, so hooked, how to build habit forming products, indistractable, how to control your attention and choose your life. So it's a very specific question. And so the hardest part was filtering out all the stuff that, you know, very interesting, great for dinner party conversation, but maybe not exactly applicable to the, the question I was trying to solve. So when it came to Hooked, for example, I rely on the work of BJ Fogg, uh, BF Skinner, uh, Albert Brandura. There's lots and lots and lots of psychology. Uh, Olden Milner, there's all kinds of psychology in terms of, of how we do what we do. Um, but what I think the innovation I bring to the table is combining all this amazing academic research that most product people don't, you know, aren't familiar with and putting it into a framework that you can draw on a whiteboard, get your team on the same page, have a common vocabulary and be able to use as a diagnostic tool to say, Hey, if our product isn't sticky, right? If there's, if we need to increase user engagement, we're not sure how to do it as opposed to thinking, well, what about this? What about that? What about this? And you're just increasing your, your product backlog. Instead, you can look to the model and say, ah, okay, 
I see what's missing here. The, we haven't identified a good internal trigger. The external trigger is not working. The action phase is too difficult. The re variable reward it doesn't scratch the itch, or the investment isn't improving use. It isn't improving with use. So some very specific questions that anyone can ask themselves and their product team to uh, 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 stoke the, the the flames of building the right product features next. Mm -hmm. And so would those be some of the the questions that you would go into, like, let's say an audit, right? Do you have a, a founder in, in the audience here today? Um, you know, they're not, they haven't been applying these, these you know, frameworks necessarily. They want to kind of take a step back and do a bit of an audit of where they're at today. Um, are there some some questions that maybe we can, we can talk through and that they might want to look at? Sure. Uh, so the first step of the hook model is the trigger phase. And so there are two kinds of triggers. We have what we call external triggers, which are we're very familiar with, the pings, dings, and rings in our outside environment. These are things that tell you what to do next. Everybody knows about these external triggers, but what actually turns out to be more important from a habit formation perspective are what we call the internal triggers. And this is probably the most important question that a product team can ask themselves if they're building a habit-forming product is what is that internal trigger? Because again, the goal of a habit-forming product is to not need the external triggers. When you think about a product like TikTok or Slack or uh, Instagram, or you know, you just name your habit-forming product, Amazon, Google, they don't send notifications every time you use the product, right? They don't need to send an external trigger. They don't need to send an annoying spammy message every single time to remind you to use the app. Why? Because these products have built habits. People are coming back to them on their own. Well, why? If it's not... You know, if there's not a message that says, hey, come back to Amazon or come back to Netflix or come back to Google, why do people come back? Because they formed an association with an internal trigger. An internal trigger is a psychological itch that we seek to scratch. Boredom, loneliness, fatigue, uncertainty, anxiety. This is something that product teams don't think about, but is absolutely critical. If you can't name your product's internal trigger, you're just getting lucky. Right? You're just hoping to, to, to error your way into a product market fit. But if you can identify from the beginning, hey, here's the psychological itch we seek to scratch, you can laser beam focus your team on figuring out the best way to scratch that itch. So whether it's workplace stress, okay, well, maybe we're going to, how do you, how do you solve workplace stress? Well, you give people certainty, you, 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 you know, so if it's a marketing dashboard that you're working on or some kind of SaaS product, well, if you've identified that, that internal trigger, you can modify the features of your product to make sure that that psychological itch is scratched. If it's an entertainment product, okay, let's say your inter internal trigger is boredom. Well, you know, that guides your, your development. If it's loneliness. So it's really important. And I think this is a huge mistake. I often see top product teams make is that they tell me, you know, oh, here's all the whiz bang features of my product. But when I say, okay, but what's the psychological itch? They haven't a clue. So that's super important to understand what is your product's internal trigger? What is the external trigger that prompts your user to action? There's a lot of science around how we can make sure that we send good external triggers. What we're seeing today is that people are bombarded with external triggers to the point where they just ignore all of them. And then you get into this place where it's very difficult to spur customer behavior because you know people are, are overwhelmed with external triggers. So there's some, some things we can do to overcome that, but it's very important. One, you identify your internal trigger. Two, you make sure that you have external triggers that prompt the user to action in the right context. Then three, the action phase. And the action phase is defined as the simplest behavior done in anticipation of a reward. The simplest thing the user can do to get relief from that psychological itch. And I mean, real simple, a scroll, a click, a play button, right? Very simple behaviors done in anticipation of an immediate reward. And so the key question of that phase of the hook model is how can that phase be made easier, right? How can we decrease the cognitive load, the friction, anything that gets into the user's way to get them to the third phase of the hook, which is the reward phase. And here the reward phase is not just about giving people what they want, but rather also inserting a bit of variability having some kind of uncertainty mystery. This is called an intermittent reinforcement. It comes out of the classic work of B.F. Skinner, where uh, we, we know that when a reward is given on a variable schedule of reinforcement, engagement goes up. So when you think about what makes gambling engaging, right? It's that uncertainty of these games of chance. Why do we like to watch sports matches? Well, there's uncertainty around who might win. Why do we like movies and books? Well, there's uncertainty around how the story is going to end. So wherever you see an engaging experience, things that capture people's attention, you'll always find some type of variable reward. And there are three types of variable rewards that every habit-forming product uses at least one of those variable rewards. So that's very important. And then finally, 
the last step of the hook model is the investment phase. And this is probably the most overlooked of the four steps because what most products do is they, they give people what the product manager thinks they want and then that's it. But if you're not asking for some kind of investment, and I'm not talking about monetary investment, I'm talking about psychological investment, something the user does to make the product better with use. And that can be, uh, that can be data, content, followers, reputation, anything that makes the product better and better with use. What you're doing is you're storing value. So storing value is a really big deal. Stored value, as I call it, is when the product improves with use. This is very different from uh, products made out of atoms versus products made out of bits. Right. Products in the real world, when you think about your couch, your car, your clothing, depreciate, right? With wear and tear, these things lose value. Habit-forming products, this is essential, should appreciate. This is called what I call stored value. So this is a critical component of habit-forming products. The more they are used, they should get better. Okay. And so right. that's a critical fourth step. And so this is how through successive cycles, through these four steps, trigger action, reward, investment, these are, this is how consumer habits. Are so, so creating content might be an example of investing in the product because you're kind of taking right. effort and, and creating some content or uh, Ikea building furniture in, in kind of the physical world. Right. Could it could be, it yeah. could be much simpler too. It could just be uh, uploading content or commenting or sharing or liking or adding a friend or anything that, you know, these small steps It's not, you know, the, the, the creating content uh, you'll get very, very few people. You know, there's the one nine ninety yeah, rule yeah. where 1% right. of people actually create content on a social platform. Very few people will create content, even on, you know, an app like TikTok or very few people actually create the content, but a lot of people will smash the like button or uh, follow somebody uh, or even, you know, there's two types of investment, active and passive. The active investment is when I actively create content and, and upload it to the platform. That's high friction, but there's even passive investment. So one of the reasons that TikTok is such a, a beast when it comes to how habit forming a product like TikTok is, is that their algorithm it, uh, is shaped based on passive investment. So just by how long you watch a clip, they're collecting information that they're using to tailor the algorithm to send you content in the future, right? And it's it's really effective, dangerously effective, even I think in the TikTok's case. Going back to the first step, the the triggers. Um, it was interesting hearing you talk about the emotional triggers. And, you know, I come from a world of advertising, and I feel like when we're working on campaigns, we're always thinking about the emotions and a lot more than when I'm in a room with with product folk, for example. You know, the emotion doesn't necessarily mm -hmm. come up. Um, well, my question is like, why do you think that is? Why do you think maybe advertising marketers are more geared to think about the emotion, but when you're actually building a product, you might not put yourself in that headspace? Yeah, I think I think product tends to be steered by uh, by engineers, right? It tends to you know product that the, the the most respected person in the room to, in a in a tech company is the the person who's technical, and I think that's that that tends to. Uh, you know, to some degree, that that's that was good, right? Because uh, tech products were, uh, you know, for for a very long time, for decades, uh, the low hanging fruit was well, if you could automate something, if you could make it more efficient, you know, it, everybody would buy it. Uh, but I think those days are over. That now you can't just get people to 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 use a product uh, because it will save them a little bit of money. Um, now you know the low hanging fruit has been picked. Uh, you have to get people to use a product because they want to, not because they have to. And I see this all the time. Actually, I started getting calls uh, as of uh, last year, 2021. You know, as this labor crunch, uh, you know, is happening worldwide, uh, especially with top talent, that people are now saying they are quitting companies. Right? They are they are not going to work at a company, or they're quitting a current company because they use crappy software. So literally people are saying, if you make me use this shitty software, I'm not going to work here. This is awful. I can't stand it. It's ruining my life. And they're right <laughs> because right. it used to be that software was adopted top down, right? So like the CTO would say, hey, everybody at the company is going to use this uh, um, this knowledge management system. We're all going to use it whether you like it or not. And people said, okay, because their de job depended on it. Well, not anymore, right? Now they're, they're, that uh, you know, with the consumerization of IT, people are adopting products bottom up. Right. When you think about Slack, mm -hmm. GitHub, Stack Overflow, uh, Salesforce, these products were adopted from frontline workers, and then corporate started paying for it. Mm -hmm. So that's where things are going, right? So what what my point is that you can't just make a product that's technologically superior. In in, in some industries, you can, right? Like in pharmaceutical companies, hey, if you cure a disease, done. <laughs> but when when it comes to most of the products we're talking about, SaaS services, education products, financial services, uh, healthcare, these type of products, you know, when it comes to user behavior type products. 
uh, you've got to start with the psychology first. And so I think that's that's now changing, that uh, people understand that to change consumer behavior, uh, it can't just be about technical superiority. That's table stakes. Everybody has a technically nice product. It's also about where you can get people to change their behavior. Okay. And then uh, sticking with the, with the triggers and I guess like the beginning of the habit formation in general, um, you know, it's interesting that we can unconsciously build a habit around a product, you know, based on, on how we interact with it and the rewards we get from it, so on and so forth. Um, but sometimes when we're trying to consciously create a habit, it can be so difficult. So have you, have you picked up on anything in there that, that might be interesting to, to talk about? Like, why is it that, you know, TikTok, I can get hooked on it and form that habit right away, but, you know, trying to eat healthy, trying to exercise or some of the things that are good for us are so much harder to adopt those habits consciously yeah. when I'm actually consciously trying to adopt it versus like an unco unconscious, you know, habit to, that's being formed. Yeah, it's a great question. And so the 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 difference, it, I wouldn't say it's conscious versus unconscious. I would say that it's different methods, whether you are trying to build a habit or break a habit. Okay. And that's why I wrote two different books, right? Mm -hmm. Indistractable is a very different book from Hooked, even though it uses some of the same psychology. It turns out that the psychology around building a habit is completely different from breaking a habit. And so when you say like, why is it, you know, why is it so easy to get hooked to TikTok and so hard to lose weight? Uh, it's because losing weight requires breaking bad habits, right? Mm -hmm. So to lose weight, we all know the formula is eat right and exercise, right? Not, there's no rocket science there, but of course, easier said than done because one, the thing you have to do is not habit forming. So what do you have to do to lose weight? You have to exercise. Well, exercise uh, by definition is pretty difficult to turn into a habit. Why? Why is the What's the definition of a habit? A habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. Okay, so people misapply the word habits all the time. And there's kind of this popular belief that anything can be turned into a habit. I want an exercise habit. I want a writing habit. I want a meditation habit. Those three things you can almost never turn into a habit. Why? Because a behavior is a habit is a behavior done with little or no conscious thought. I don't know about you, but when I'm exercising, it's a lot of thought. It's hard, right? I'm sweating and I'm huffing and I'm puffing and it hurts, right? Because that's kind of what exercise has to do if you want to get better at it. Now, I will say a little asterisk here. For many people, you know, just taking a walk, you can walk habitually. How do you know? What's the test? Because you can listen to a podcast as you're walking, okay? It, depending on your fitness level. For some people, a walk is a lot of work, so it's not a habit. But for some people, taking a daily walk, you can have a conversation. You can do all kinds of other things while you're taking that walk. It could be a habit. But for most people, when it comes to changing their lifestyle and adopting a, a behavior like uh, exercise, by definition, will not be a habit. It will be a routine. A routine is just a series of behaviors frequently repeated. So you say, well, what's the big deal? Well, you call it a routine. Somebody else calls it a habit. What's the difference? The difference is if you expect everything to be easy, right? When people say, I want to build a habit around something, what they're really saying is, I want to have done that behavior. I don't like doing it. I want to have done it. I want to have exercised. I want to have written my book. I want to have meditated, but I don't like the actual action itself right? It's hard. So why don't I make it a habit and make it put on autopilot? The yeah. problem is when, when people have that perception, after a month or two, they look at it and say, crap, this is still hard. I don't like it. <laughs> and they think that there's something wrong with them. They're somehow broken. There's nothing broken about them. It's that they're misapplying this technique. The technique itself is what's broken. So what I say is that to change these type of behaviors, uh, we have to change our mindset. And realize that discomfort is part of the process, that we have to get comfortable with discomfort. What we call these internal triggers that we talked about earlier are critical, right? So this is a big revelation that, that I made writing Indistractable, is that if you look at why we do what we do, let's back up here. Let's really start from square run, from, uh, from, from first principles. If we want to understand why we do certain things and we don't do others, we have to understand human motivation. So what is motivation? Fundamentally, what is motivation? Motivation is fundamentally the, the, the desire to escape discomfort, okay? Everything you do, it's not about the pursuit of pleasure and the avoidance of pain. It's only one of those things. It's actually only the desire to escape discomfort, okay? Everything you do, even the desire to feel pleasure, right? Even that wanting, lusting, craving, desire is psychologically destabilizing. So everything you do, everything you do, it's called the homeostatic response. It's about the desire to escape discomfort, which therefore means that time management is pain management. Time management is pain management. I would add to that, 
Weight management is pain management. Money management is pain management. That if all human behavior is spurred by a desire to escape discomfort, it's about managing our discomfort in order to do the things we want to do and to avoid the things we don't want to do. That this is con our struggle in life. And by the way, this isn't new. <laughs> this is basically the essential teachings of Buddhism, <laughs> right? That it's all about suffering. It's fundamentally about dealing with our discomfort. But by looking at it through that lens, we can dissolve ourselves of these stupid notions that, oh, it's Facebook that's distracting me. It's email that's distracting me. It's the NFL that's distracting me. It's the news that's distracting me. Bullshit, okay? You will always find distraction, whether it's too much news, too much booze, too much football, too much Facebook. You're always going to find distraction unless you understand the root cause. And the root cause is always one thing, your desire to escape discomfort, which is why we first have to master those internal triggers or they become our masters. That's, that's really interesting. And I, and I love the differentiation there between, you know, a habit and a routine, you know, I, I so much of, let's say the, a lot of the, the, the blogging around there and uh, content around, you know, productivity and wake up and build these habits of, you know, whatever it is, exercising and journaling or, um, you know, how you manage your time, how you manage your day. Um, you know, what you're saying is that those are not actually, those aren't habits because you have to be present in them. You have to actually work for them. You're managing pain, um, right. which is very uh, counterintuitive way to think about it. And, and the idea that, you know, exercising is not about picking up the habit of exercising, for example, it is, it's about, uh, you know, doing that consciously. And it's, I think it might seem like splitting hairs to some people, but I think that it's, it's actually quite a profound difference in how you think about it. And yeah, I, I think so. Realization yeah. could maybe help you approach it in a very different way. That's right. It's about finding the right tool for the job. So sometimes for certain behaviors, yeah, make them into habits. But for other behaviors, if you expect them to become a habit and they don't, you're going to be disappointed. You're going to blame yourself. What you should be blaming is the guru, guru who gave you the wrong technique, <laughs> right? So it's really about finding the right tool for the job. You don't uh, smash in a nail with a screwdriver. You use a hammer. And so I think the same goes with different with different behaviors we're trying to change. Yeah. It's interesting thinking about distractions in a, you know, remote working world. You know, when you're at home, there's a lot more distractions, potentially at different kinds of distractions. Well, maybe not more, just different kinds of distractions. You're not necessarily being uh, watched. There isn't people around you where you feel like you need to, you know, force yourself to behave a certain way or what have you. Um, do you have any, any thoughts about distractions in, in like, your home environment versus the workplace and maybe how those might differ? Absolutely. So there's a whole section uh, in Indistractable about uh, building an indistractable workplace. And there's another section around uh, about essentially working from home and having indistractable relationships. And so uh, when, when, we first, when I first wrote the book, we did surveys and we found that the number one source of distraction uh, for the modern American worker, the number one sur surveyed response was other people meaning your boss, your coworkers in the office, right? We thought it would be, you know, email or Slack or something like that. Nope, it was other people coming by your desk and uh, interrupting you while you're working on something and saying, hey, your boss saying, hey, where's that TPS report? Or your colleague saying, hey, did you hear the latest gossip? Uh, so that was the kind of distractions that people were facing in the office. It was other people was number one. Now that many people are working from home, guess what the number one source of distraction is? It's still not email. It's still not Slack. It's my kids. It's my pets. It's my spouse. It's my roommate. <laughs> it's still other beings that are causing that source of distraction. And the solution, so there's a, the, in, in the book, there's a section on hacking back external triggers. And the solution is pretty simple, actually. In both cases, whether it's in the office or outside the office, it's around interrupting the interruption. What does that look like? So in every copy of my book, Indistractable, there's a piece of cardstock that you pull out of the book. And if you buy the ebook or the audio book, you can download this as well. It's a it's a, this bright red piece of cardstock that you fold into this triangle and you put it on your computer monitor. And when your colleagues pass by your desk, they will see this sign, they can't miss it, on your computer monitor that says, I'm indistractable, please come back later. Okay, so what you're doing is you're interrupting that interruption so that your colleagues, if you're in the office, know that you that, that you are working without distraction. Now you say, oh, well, I, that's what I put on headphones for. Let me tell you, you know, and I know that when people see you wearing headphones, they think you're listening to Spotify. They think you're watching a YouTube video or something. So you want to be very explicit that, nope, I'm working without distraction right now. I'll be with you later. Okay. In the home setting. So when I was writing this book, my daughter was only uh, six years old. 
And it was a big problem because we were working from home and she would interrupt us. So what did we do? My wife went to Amazon and she bought what we call the concentration crown. It's this light up wreath that she puts on her head that you can't miss. She bought it for like $5 on Amazon. And we sat down with my daughter when she was only six years old. And we said, look, when mommy is wearing the concentration crown, that means she can't be interrupted. We, be, we will be with you within 30 minutes. So the rule is in my household, unless someone's bleeding, you don't interrupt mommy and daddy if, if they're wearing the concentration crown. Works like a charm. Even a child of six years old can understand that when they see this interrupt, when they, they see the, the concentration crown, it interrupts the interruption. It works incredibly well with kids. It also works really well with husbands, by the way, <laughs> so I wouldn't constantly interrupt her as well. And so there, this is just one of dozens of different techniques that we can use um, to, to make sure that, that we find that time to be indistractable. Mm -hmm. That's, that's so, it's so interesting. And so you, you've kind of worked on, on very two sides of this, this habit formation. Um, having, did you work on them kind of at the same time? Did you do it one and then the other? What was that process like? Cause I, you know, they seem so interconnected, the two of them. Um, I'm curious what that process was like and maybe what some of the surprises that were, that you had along, along the way. I definitely worked on one at a time. Um, I didn't have the problem of being distracted until I got busy. <laughs> so when I wrote Hooked, um, I had plenty of time and focus, and uh, there weren't that many demands on my time. And so, uh, but when I when the when Hooked came out, and I I had more speaking engagements and consulting work and angel investments and a lot more, I was a lot busier. I had less and less time to do the thing that made me successful in the first place, which was the writing. And so I was desperately looking for a solution for myself. Uh, every book I write, I write for me first. And so not only is that are all the techniques in the book based on good, solid science, they're also practically useful. Like I actually use all these techniques myself. And so I, I wrote Indistractable very much to solve this problem uh, for myself. And uh, uh, of course, you know, it, it, they are connected, right? Hooked is about building good habits and uh, Indistractable is about breaking these bad habits. So there, there was a lot of connection, uh, but it was kind of like a springboard one for the other. Mm -hmm. Did you see, and, and forgive me if this is this is in the book, but it'd be great for the audience as well, um, any way to break bad habits and how people are using products? You know, people using your, your product wrong potentially. Not, is, is there some application there of, of the opposite where you're trying to build certain habits, but maybe you want to break certain habits and how your users are, are using your product as well? Sure. So the, 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 that's just an iterative process. So we use what we call cohort analysis, and there's many tools out there that help you do this, like Amplitude, which I happen to be affiliated with as well. I'm a product evangelist for them. Uh, part of the reason I love the product is because it helps you see uh, what engagement and retention looks like and habituation looks like for your product. So uh, the way the pro process works is you take out the hook model. And you build some hypotheses for what can change in your product design, right? What can you change in your user experience to make it more habit forming? You make that change in the product. Uh, and then you see for the next cohort of users, did the percentage of habituated users go up or did it go down? And so there's no magic answer to say, oh, this will work for every company every time. What does work every time is using that tool that those four steps to the hook model we described earlier to diagnose what hypotheses you might be able to implement into your product to see if it works. But we still have to go through that build, measure, learn loop. Hopefully we we, we have more successes that, uh, more frequently, but the same process around cohort analysis to see, okay, we made this change. What was the effect? Did we increase the habituated users or did we decrease the percentage of habituated users? And then we run the process all over again. Uh, so we still have to iterate. There's no way around that, but hopefully you can do so uh, in a smarter way with fewer failures. Right. And I guess, um, again, for, for our audience, a lot of them are, are earlier stage startups, right? And so, you know, the, the idea of cohort analysis is great. Sometimes there isn't enough users there. So when you're designing these experiments, you know, what do you think about in terms of like statistical significance? You know, how much data do yeah. you need in order to make a decision? You know, how long should you run a certain experiment? I, I, I recall, um, you know, you had mentioned something about habit formation within the first week of the product is, is very important. Um, and so how do you think about, about that in terms of your, your cohort analysis and how might an earlier stage product um, approach this? Yeah. So, so in the beginning, it's going to be uh, more qualitative. And then as the product matures, it's going to be more quantitative. So with a very small user base, uh, you really want to see that the, the out of the gate, you want to have at least 5% of your users habituated. Right. If you can't get 5% of your user base habituated, then you need to go back to the drawing board. And what does that mean, habituated? So every product has a level 
of frequency that it should be used. And, and you make up this number, right? A product that is a, uh, a healthcare product might have a different level of frequency of use than a social media product, for example, right? One might be used once a week, one might be used several times a day. So you need to, as a company say, here's the level of frequency we would expect a habituated user to use the product. Okay, it could be once a day, it could be five times a day, it could be once a week, doesn't matter. Should be within a week's time or less. That's the critical cutoff point, a week's time or less. But let's say you have that number. What you're going to do is to look at your users and understand even a product with just a, a few hundred users can do this to say what percentage of my users are using it to that degree. What percentage of my users are using it, let's say once a week, twice a week, whatever the number you make up is, that is a habituated user. And so now you have your percentage of habituated users. And so you can do that right out of the gate, even with a few hundred customers, even if it's, uh, you know, you're, even if you're counting them manually, you can do that. Uh, so 5%, you have a problem. If it's less than 5%, Go back to the drawing board. Uh, once you get to twenty percent, thirty percent, now we're now we're talking. Now we're cooking, uh, and so that's when you start pouring fuel on the fire to you know improve the UX to even start maybe growing your user base. What I see a lot of companies doing is uh, they raise a bunch of money from a VC based on a pipe dream about yeah people will totally use this product. They don't hit the five percent habituated user number, and they start prematurely growing the product, and then it ends up as a disaster. We call these businesses leaky buckets, right? Yeah. I see it all the time. They call me the plumber because I they call me after <laughs> they're leaking customers, and I'm supposed to come in and try and fix the leaks. Sometimes you can't <laughs> because the product sucks and they didn't build it properly from the from the get go. Um, but but many times, you know, sometimes many times you can fix it, but uh, many times you can't. And so it's critical to not waste all that time and money to first make sure that your product is sticky. And this is a really, really important point. There's such an emphasis these days uh, in tech products on growth, right? That there's this ideology that growth fixes everything. Well, you can always buy growth, right? You can back up the truck of VC cash, give it to Facebook, give it to Google. They will drive users to your product or service, right? You can grow your user base. That's stupid. Mm -hmm. If you don't keep those users, okay, you're a leaky bucket. So never, uh, never uh, put the cart before the horse. You always have to make sure you have engagement before growth. Okay, engagement comes before growth because if you're going to back up the truck and buy your users, uh, or even through viral spread, right? Even I've seen companies that don't spend much money on on uh, uh, on user acquisition. They it's viral, but even then, people share the product. And then they start using it and then it collapses. It crashes, right? We saw, uh, we saw this with Clubhouse to some degree, right? It wasn't sticky yeah. enough to form a habit. Yeah. So even though they did spend much money on advertising, even the users they acquired didn't stick around. They leaked out. That's awful. <laughs> That's so sad. So before you start growing a product, you want to make sure you nail engagement. Mm -hmm. That's, I agree with you wholeheartedly. Having um, often been the person blamed for bringing the wrong people because <laughs> they're, you know, as a marketer, bringing people in and, and, oh, it's not the right people. You know, you're, you're bringing us the wrong, the wrong, uh, traffic. You're putting it in front of the wrong people, whatever. I've, I've been in that situation where I get blamed a lot for, for that sort of yeah. thing when, when the leaky bucket problem. I'm hasn't sorry. Been, I, been, I, <laughs> been fixed. I feel your pain. And it's, it's ridiculous actually, because if someone took the effort to come to the page and oftentimes you know, I see, you see it all the time. They will even sign up. They'll sign right? up, they'll register, they go through all the steps, and but then they don't stick as around. As far as I'm so, concerned, yeah. you did the job. If they sign up, if they onboarded, you did your job, right? You yeah. deserve the gold star. If they don't stick around, that's not your fault anymore. That's the product team's fault. Right. And you've obviously been in, in, in these rooms since you are uh, the plumber. Um, you know, why aren't these conversations happening more? Do you, in, in your opinion, right? Like why is growth the cart before the horse happens so frequently? I, yeah, I can't tell you how many startups we mm -hmm. work with. We work with tons of startups and they might be coming out of whatever incubator or whatever, you know, seed round or what have you. And all their attention is on, okay, how do we grow this before a lot of the fundamentals of engagement and retention and referral and so on and so forth have been built or, or baked in kind of growth yeah. is number one thing. Like, why is there still that that pressure there to to grow, even though it might hurt them in the long run? Yeah, because growth is easy, uh, it's fun, and it's exciting. Right. Uh, and and many times engagement, the question kind of questions you have to ask yourself for engagement are tough questions, and sometimes require a lot of work. Uh, and a lot of times require you to to uh, suck up your ego and say, "Oh, the current product kind of sucks. We need to fix some stuff." Uh, whereas if you want growth, oh, that's easy peasy, right? Let's get press. Let's spend money on ads. Let's, uh, you know, d d d fix the marketing copy. It's a lot easier 
frankly. And so it's a path of least resistance. Uh, of course, entrepreneurs, if you've been working on a product and you're super excited about it and you love it, it's your baby, uh, no one wants to hear that their baby's ugly, <laughs> right? They want to share their baby with the world. And so that's why I think there's this bias that we really do have to fight to make sure, hey, you know what, before we start spending money on growth, have we nailed engagement? Can we see 20% of our users are habituated? If we can't, uh, we need to keep working on the product before we blow all that money on growth. So based on what you're saying, it sounds like there might be a, a habit formed there for startups, you know, right? It's moving away from yeah. pain, <laughs> moving away from these conversations, right? Doing the fun thing, the thing that gets you the, you know, the, the, that dopamine hit because you're growing and you're getting the press and what have you. Um, seems like we got a, a habit that we might need to break. <laughs> I think that's a... a yeah, you're right. You're right. There is a path of least resistance there. Yeah, I, I think that's a great place to, to, to end it. Thank you so much for your time. I know the audience is, is really going to appreciate the, you know you sharing all of these insights with us. Um, for folks that want to look you up, obviously they can read one of your books, but if they want to find you online, where, where should they go? Sure. So my website is nearandfar.com. That's spelled like my first name, N-I-R. So nearandfar.com. And the first book is called Hooked, How to Build Habit-Forming Products. And my second book is called Indistractable, How to Control Your Attention and Choose Your Life. And they're both available wherever books are sold. Any parting advice that you might give an early stage startup? Hmm. I guess the best piece of advice is to build something that you yourself want. Uh, I talk about this in Hooked. There's a chapter on the morality of manipulation. And I talk about how uh, to be in a good ethical place, right? These techniques are very, very powerful. And so we need to make sure that when we use behavioral design, we use it in a morally uh, ethical fashion. And the best the best thing you can do from a moral position as well as a business position is to build something for yourself. Okay. This is, a, this is an underutilized hack that if you look at the founders of, you know, the, 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 the world's most revolutionary companies of the past few decades, these are people who built first and foremost, something for themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, why do they, why do we see this? Well, the hardest part about building a product is getting, uh, is building something people want. Well, if you're building for some amorphous customer that you don't really understand super well, it's really hard to do. Whereas if you build something for yourself, you, you kind of can't fail, right? It doesn't matter if you don't IPO because you built a product you yourself want. And chances are, if you build something that you really need, right, other people will probably find it helpful as well. So that I think is an underutilized hack uh, is to build something that you yourself want to see in the world that you believe materially improves people's lives. Great. Thank you so much for your time today. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Thank you.